The following program is a UWTV classic. From the University of Washington in Seattle, Upon Reflection with Al Page. Our guests are Judy Woodruff, news correspondent for the McNeil Lair News Hour and host of Frontline, and Al Hunt, Washington bureau chief for the Wall Street Journal. Judy, what's the difference between how television presents the news and how the print media presents the news? Television does it a lot better, Al. I mean, we're you know we've got the visuals, we've got the we've got the uh, the emotional impact when that's called for. No, seriously. Um, uh, do you want a serious answer to this? Uh, you give me both. <laughs> um, I think I think it's um, uh, primarily the pictures and the fact that that we can amplify every story with a with a visual, with with uh, uh, a, a picture tells us, you know, is, is equal to a thousand words. Uh, and sometimes that's the case. What we can't do, and which, what print can do, is, uh, is give people sometimes the, the luscious detail that, that makes a story come alive, that, that tells you uh, the ins and outs of a story that, that you really don't have time to get into in television. So, um, you know, I think both medium both media has it have their strengths, but they also have, uh, to some extent, their weaknesses. Al, do you agree? Yeah, um, I remember when we were married, <coughs> Jody Powell, who was then the White House press secretary, said, said it was a perfect union because the Wall Street Journal didn't have pictures and NBC News didn't have news. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I think there's a big difference between what Judy now does with McNeil Lair and public television and the commercial television uh, networks because I think the, the major difference that you draw between print and television when you're talking about the commercial outlets is that uh, is really depth, uh, substance, time, etc. And uh, as a general proposition, there are not very many important stories that you can tell in a minute 20. I think Neil Lair is a notable is a notable exception there. In that sense, much closer to print. There also are stories now, I think that just lend themselves to television, and there are other stories that lend themselves to newspapers. I mean, if you talk about an unfolding scandal or an, or the ethics issue or whatever have you, that is much more of a newspaper story. If on the other hand you talk about something like a you know a natural disaster or even China before. Uh, they cut off the cameras. That's much more of a that's much more of a television story. Judy, pick up on that a, a bit. What kind of stories do you think television does best? What is television really good at? People stories, uh, stories that involve real human feelings, real human suffering. Uh, Frontline is uh, is airing at the end of this season a story about uh, a small town in western Kentucky uh, that has a terrible problem with a hazardous waste. Uh, site there, and uh, and the question that's unresolved is whether industry is responsible. But what that documentary does in a little under an hour is let you see the human impact of the of um, of this pollution, whether the industry or whatever is at fault, the cancer that has come into the into this little town. Um, I think while a print a newspaper story might tell that story very well, television has that added. Uh, uh, you know the, uh, you know the look on someone's face, uh, the the trembling in their voice, uh, sometimes the tears, and I don't mean to make it sound sensational because it doesn't always have to be that way, but certainly those stories that in, that involve people. Al, you talked earlier about in-depth stories in the print media. Is is in-depth really a relative term? Certainly, stories are not the same thing as a book. No, that's true, and it's also true that um, it's also true that uh, newspapers, as the late Philip Graham once said, at their very best, their very very best, are a rough first draft of history, and that's when we're doing a good job. Uh, so no, it's not war and peace, nor should it be. <clears throat> but I do think that I do think that uh, context is important in a story. Uh, I think uh, significance, the why of a story, background is important. And I think all of that is, in most instances, very difficult to do in that minute, 20 second time allotted to most evening news uh, programs and commercial networks. Is there an advantage to a story because you can go back and refer to it again and again, uh, even while you're reading it? Y yeah, there is, and that, you know, that also gets to the question of impact. Um, I've always thought in politics that 
that newspapers tend to set the agenda, uh, that newspapers sort of decide which stories are going to be covered, and television tends to follow that. Television still has a bit of an, of an inferiority complex. They let newspapers set that agenda. And then once a story becomes important, television then dominates the dialogue. Then we become, we become incidental. In 1984, uh, during the uh, general election, we wrote the first story about Reagan's age problem. It was after that first debate, and we had a front page piece. The debate was Sunday night. We had a front page piece that ran on Tuesday morning on Reagan's age. And everybody picked it up, all three networks picked it up that night. And it became, for two or three days, you remember, a great big issue. And I was with John Chancellor about a week later, and he said, boy, wasn't the White House livid about that? You know, they were all over me, calling. I said, geez, I never heard a word from them. So once it becomes an issue, television takes over, uh, takes over and dominates the dialogue. But I think, Judy, there are I think there are exceptions to that, I, and I understand what Al is saying, and I think for a long time that was, that was the case almost without exception. But you, but you do now see, not just during presidential campaigns, political campaigns, but in the normal coverage in Washington, you see um, the networks and television outlets breaking stories. I mean, we just saw... Uh, uh, this past spring, we saw uh, CBS News break a story about uh, Bill Gray, the congressman from Pennsylvania who was going to run, uh, who was running then for House Majority Whip, the number three position in the Democratic leadership in the House. And that story was a big splash, uh, you know, in, in terms of the House leadership race. Yeah, that story also was a bad story. It was an incorrect story. So television sometimes does break uh, phony but stories. But there was an investigation <laughs> underway that involved Bill Gray in terms of his being interviewed. And that's, yeah. you know, but so. That, but, but, I mean, I think if you look at the whole ethics issue, I mean, I think that CBS story wasn't exclusive, which I think did end up a pretty bad story. Uh, but I think if you look at the whole ethics issue, whether, whether it's Jim Wright or whether it's uh, 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 Tony Quello or whether it's uh, some of the problems that Gingrich is now having, those are stories that have tended, the first stories have tended to be newspaper stories. Now, so far we agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let, let's change the subject. Do you care what the television presenter looks like? No. I don't care what a television personality looks like. I care what a television personality, I care what their journal, we're talking about television journalism now, uh, I care about their journalistic uh, talents. I think there's some people in television who, who I suppose wouldn't be on any, any uh, <clears throat> most attractive list who I think are just first class journalists. And there are others that are probably uh, terribly attractive who are, uh, who are bubbleheads. I would also say we have our share of bubbleheads in the print in the print side, too. Hey, that's the first time I've heard a print person admit that. I wouldn't want to talk about the percentages. <laughs> <laughs> None of them is at the Wall Street Journal, actually. <laughs> Judy, can you argue that style is more important in newspaper writing than it is in television? Hmm. Well, certainly because newspapers and, and print outlets don't have pictures, which we've been talking about, uh, I think this, the style of writing uh, comes into play. I mean, I know I, it's much more fun for me to read a newspaper story that's that's very well written than it is one that's just sort of patched together. Uh, so you know the the ability of a reporter or a writer to write, I think, is is important. But but the bottom line for me, I mean, if you're reading a newspaper, you want to know what's going on, and and uh, you know if they've got the facts there, if they've got you know the information, if they're telling you something that no one else has told you. I mean, for me, that's you know that's the most important thing. But yes, if there's if it's well written, if the style is is a very powerful style, that you know that makes it all the more interesting to read and more fun to read. How stylistic can you be in television writing? I think to some extent you can be Al, but not very much. Um, I I was trained as a television reporter to write to pictures. Uh, to the extent there were pictures to tell the story, not to fight those pictures. What do you mean, write the pictures? If the picture showing someone uh, uh, going into a room and starting a fight, um, let that let that happen, and don't talk about the um, uh, you know if, if say if something happened on the hill and and somebody went into a room and started an argument, uh, while that's happening on the picture, don't talk about. Um, the background to the disagreement. Don't talk about the piece of legislation that, that passed last year that was the instigator of all this. I mean, let it move, and then when the pictures, when the, when the interesting pictures are finished, then you can, you can get into the, into the drama. So I, but I think that, you know, sure, there's some room for maneuver, and, you know, again, on McNeil-Lara, we try to, 
you know, we try to use those spaces in between the pictures to tell people what's going on and to use the pictures to tell people what's going on. And I happen to think you can do that. The one difference that I'd like to mention is that I think a talking head is a, is a beautiful thing. I mean, I think, you know, this notion that just having somebody sitting and... Uh, Depends on who's talking. Well, that's right. Not necessarily, though. I mean, it's, uh, you know, just about anybody can be interesting at some point in their lives. But, you know, to have somebody sit there and talk about um, something that they know something about and that they tell in an interesting way. I mean, what's, you know, what's better television than that? Uh, I want us to jump in here. I don't think talking heads are, are necessarily uh, always or even most of the time uh, interesting, but I, I will jump to the defense of television and say that I, I just to, to cite one example, uh, for years I have marveled at Charles Corral and what he can do with a television story. I think that's some of the best writing in American in American journalism. Uh, I don't know that there, there, there are an awful lot of places on commercial television uh, that, that get, a lot of times they give people the kind of outlets that he's had, but I think he certainly is a, is a, is a striking example of, of creative writing in television. What does it mean that a writer has style? Geez, we have a couple writers who I think probably have as much style as anyone in American journalism, and what it really means is that they can absolutely captivate you with a story. Uh, style is only important as it affects the reader, obviously. And uh, there's some, we have a fellow named Dennis Farney out in, who's out in Kansas, he's part of the Washington Bureau, he's a Kansas annex of the Washington Bureau, who writes about national issues. And he can, uh, you, 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 if Dennis is writing about the plight of a farmer in the, in the, in the, uh, in the terrible drought, you're there with that farmer. I mean, you are right there, it's vivid. And I think that's what style really is. Style is not just the use of colorful adjectives or even great quotes. It's just taking you there with an event, with a person. Can a writer have too much style? There's a lot of overwriting that you see in journalism, and some people try to, try to emulate the, the great writers. Again, it kind of goes, it, it's a variation of what Judy was saying about television. You, you have to let a story tell itself. And, and that's what the great stylists do. They, they know how to let a story tell itself. When you overwrite, uh, if the, I want to be there with that farmer. I don't want the person hitting me over the head telling me, here you are, there, you know, here with the farmer. Uh, and and uh, that's the difference between great writers and great stylists and, uh, and mediocre ones. Can you train a writer to suppress his or her impressions? Uh, if you do so, do you cripple their spirit? I don't want a writer uh, to suppress his or her impressions. I think impressions are terribly important. I think it's a subjective business. Uh, I think we always try to be fair, but the notion that we're objective is, <coughs> is, uh, is nonsense. You can't be objective. You, the selection of what you put into a story is a very subjective decision. It's a, every time you sit down at the, uh, at, the, at the computer, or in the old days, a typewriter, you're making uh, very subjective decisions. I don't want them to suppress their uh, their impressions. I want to, I want them to suppress any 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 ideology they might have or or, or anything like that. But I don't want to I don't want them to suppress their impressions. But where do you draw the line between impressions and facts? Well, that's the, what the business is about. That's the difference between the good ones and the bad ones. Uh, but uh, you know, out to to a large extent, the facts are are. Are there, and you and you and you write about them. But what really separates a great newspaper story from a mediocre one, or a great journalist from a mediocre one, are those who can then take those facts and 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 then give you their impressions of what their significance is. And that's the you know that's a, that's every day we are making decisions as to whether someone has crossed over that line or wh whether someone has done that well or not so well. I mean, I think that's really what the that's part of the reason the business is so exciting. Judy, where do you think you draw the line between impressions and facts? That's very tough. I mean, uh, you know, as Al said, there's no such thing as being, there's really no such thing as being completely objective because you bring with you to any story you cover the sum total of all your experiences as a person. Um, you know, and what you've seen and where you've studied and what you've read or haven't read and, and all that comes together to form your, you know, what's back here when you're watching and, and behind, you know, when you're listening and um, it, that's a very tough thing, but I think somehow those of us who've done this for a while, you know, you begin to sort of build in a sense, if you do it well, you begin to build in sort of a sixth sense of, of what crossing the line is, what, what your question is addressing, you know, where does 
observing and, and telling us, you know, what it looked like and what preceded this and a little bit about the background and crossing over into uh, pronouncing one side better than the other. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, it's not a, there's not a black and white Delineation. I'll give you two. I'll give you two good examples uh, of the same sort. The vice presidential debate last October, in which Judy Judy was the moderator, uh, and then and then the final Dukakis Bush debate. Uh, I felt that it wasn't enough just to say uh, the two vice presidential candidates, Dan Quayle and Lloyd Benson, traded charges last night because it was quite clear something happened. I mean, one did did we thought clearly better than the other. Uh, in the sense that uh, that Lloyd Benson seemed to do quite well, and Dan Quayle fell on his face. Uh, now that that was tough to, tough decision that you're making in a matter of minutes as to how you then fashion that story, because in a way your readers, most of your readers have seen that have seen that uh, debate, and you're telling them not only what happened, but you're telling them that one guy did a lot better than the other. Uh, and in the same way, in the, in, the, in the second Dukakis Bush debate, it seemed to us quite clear that Dukakis was, was flat and did a terrible job. Uh, but, I all, but, but, but I think you have an obligation to do more than, uh, than just say, uh, uh, you know, who, uh, who, what, and where. Judy, how much license should a television personality have to express her personality on the air? I think there ought to be some room for that because, you know, just to sit and recite in essence, what is the, the who, what, when, and where is is terribly, uh, uh, you know, it's limited. It, it, you know, it doesn't it doesn't give you the the again the rich detail that that makes the story. Um, but again, there's a line. I mean, how much how much personality do you want to put into story? Again, I was trained to be to be to very much try to stay in the background when I was reporting to keep myself out of it. And, and when I was reporting, for example, in local television in Atlanta back in the 1970s, um, one of my news directors said to me, you know, you don't do a stand-up uh, unless, you know, there's a reason for you to do one, and you don't appear in the news story unless uh, there's a very, very good reason for you to be there. Whereas I had colleagues on the other side of town who were trying to get themselves into, you know, this story and that one. It's um, Emmy time. <laughs> that's right. So, um, you know, maybe I come out of a fairly old-fashioned school on that one, but I, but I think, um, I think, yes, express your, yourself, I mean, your, your, your style or whatever, but don't artificially inject yourself into a situation. I have had people, I've traveled around the country some, and I've had people say, I, I'm a great fan of your, of, your, of your wife. And I say, oh, it's really nice. They say, I never miss Face the Nation. That's terrific. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know Leslie Stahl anywhere. I mean, you've seen one blonde television reporter, you've seen them all. Uh, and, and, and I think that, I think that uh, uh, there, is, there is a certain sense that, um, that, uh, that people out there really try to identify with people on television, which we don't get in print. I mean, I never was recognized in my life until I did a television uh, uh, show. But every time that we begin to think... Being very modest Well, no, now. it's true. <laughs> Although the first time I was mistaken for someone about 20 years older than I was, which again was quite a humbling experience. But television does that. You cover campaigns with, um, with people like, uh, like a Rather or a, or, a, or a Brokaw, and all of a sudden they become a bigger story than the, than the, uh, than the candidate. Judy, have you ever exerted your personality on the air and then have said, I just can't believe what I just said? A couple of times, sure. Um, it's, it's easier, actually, for me to do that on a McNeil Lehrer where I'm in a live interview situation than it is, say, when I was working for NBC and being asked to do a minute 30 on what the president said that day. Um, it's, it's harder in that, in that arena. Excuse me, but now, if I'm doing an interview with someone and they say something that I find, you know, surprising, I'll react. I'll say, gee, I didn't expect you to say that. Or if I goof, I'll say, I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, I mean, I feel more comfortable about doing that now, but that's because of the format. Uh, whereas if you're pre-taping a minute 20 or a minute 30, um, there's not as much maneuvering space. But I remember when Judy was, uh, Judy was anchoring the Today Show one week, and they did a piece on great restaurants of the world. They were talking about these great three-star restaurants in Paris and in Rome, and they finished, and it came back to Judy and Brian, and, and we have a neighborhood restaurant called the Roma that we love to go to. It's got a little garden out back, and it would never be confused with one of the great restaurants in the world, but it's fun for us to go to. And they came back to Judy, and she said to Brian, well, you know, our, our 
our, our great uh, restaurant in the world is the Roma, where we take the kids all the time. It was kind of a quick aside. We went to Roma about a week later, and they said, people are coming in from out of town. <laughs> they're, going, they're going from Omaha and then from New Mexico trying to get reservations. <laughs> That's funny. Judy, when do you know you've done a good job? When do you really feel good after a program is over? When I feel good about it. Uh, I mean, no matter how many people come up to me and say, hey, that was a great interview or that was a really good piece, I don't necessarily believe it unless I know inside that it was right, that it was right on, that I had the interviews and I had the information and I had, you know, that the, the message that I think was in that story got across or, or that something came alive in that interview that you really learned something either about the person or about the subject. Um, you know, I'm my harshest critic. But again, is it just sense, sixth sense, something inside? Yeah, I mean, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, I, there are some interviews that I think fall flat. I mean, I'm constantly asking myself, what should I have asked, or why didn't I leave out that question when I'm doing an interview? Uh, and I'll go back over the questions that I ask, and I'll think, well, why didn't I pursue? And sometimes I know I can go back and look at, you know, the handwritten notes I'd made to myself, and I'll say, I should have pursued that answer. He or she said such and so, and I missed an opportunity there. And I can, it's just, it's just as little... You know, it's as clear as a bell to me what I did wrong. Uh, and on other, you know, a couple of times, I think, you know, I'll think I did it, you know, it was okay. How do you know, Judy, when someone's gaming you, when you really have a difficult situation on your hands? I don't always know. I mean, I'd like to say, to sit here and tell you that I've been doing this for 22 years and therefore I can spot a, a mile away, but um, I like to think that I've, I've become a decent judge of, uh, not so much people maybe, but, but news subjects that I can kind of gauge, you know, when a person is on the level with me. But, uh, you know, I've made mistakes. I mean, I've, I've swallowed what some people told me hook, line, and sinker and found out later that there was a whole lot more to the story than what they were saying. I, I try to be careful and cautious and check things that I'm told with other people always, but sometimes you get taken. Al, how do you know when you've done a good piece of work? Usually you know it right after you've written it. I mean, usually, usually when you do it, I don't even wait for reaction. If I've written a piece uh, that, I, that I really feel good about, uh, then it doesn't matter uh, that I haven't gotten a reaction yet because it hasn't run yet. I just feel terrific. But so, so I know if I've done a terrific piece, if I've written a terrific column, I feel very, very good about it. Uh, on the other hand, there's no doubt that reaction does matter, that if you get if you do a piece and all of a sudden you get seven phone calls, it becomes even better, or depending on what the phone calls are. Uh, <laughs> and if it gets picked up... Uh, well, people they, usually don't call unless they like something, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, they, you know. yeah. Well, no, not necessarily. I mean, they can, well. they can call the other, but there's certain stories. I now spend most of my time running the Washington Bureau, so I don't write nearly as much as I used to, so it's, I, my, my thrills tend to be more vicarious, or more derivative at least. And, uh, but, but when we do a good story, for instance, when we broke a whole bunch of stories in Jim Wright, I mean, the minute I'd see that first three or four paragraphs when David Rogers or Brooks Jackson would hand me the story, I'd know, boy, we got it now. This is terrific. Do you criticize each other's work? I never would criticize my wife. Huh? Baloney. <laughs> no, we're, we, we're very candid with each other. I mean, as he said, he, he's not writing as often as he used to, um, but he'll ask me when he's written a piece for the for the uh, op-ed page for the journal, he'll ask me what I think and I'll tell him. I like the show pieces to do because I, I respect her judgment. And, and, and I do the same thing. I'll always ask him, did you see the interview or did you see the piece and what do you think? And, and he's candid with me and I want him to be candid with she me. Is more, she's very supportive of, um, of, of what I do for the journal. I also do a television show and she is somewhat, somewhat less supportive of my, oh, uh, of my role in that oh. television show. And I think because sometimes she thinks it, uh, it, it, isn't quite as, uh, it isn't quite up to the standards of the, uh, of the journal. No, I wouldn't say that. It's just, it's just, it's, it's, it's lively, <laughs> put it that way. Judy, how tough is it to be in a two-career family? It's tough at times, there's no question about it. I mean, we, we're constantly juggling. Al is much more organized than I am. I'm the disorganized one of the family. And he's constantly saying to me, we've got to make schedules, we've got to figure out what we're going to make time to do this and that this week. I mean, he's, he's really quite religious about that and um, and I'm getting better I'm getting more organized but um, uh, you've got to juggle and you've got to squeeze things in uh, you can't be as carefree you can't be as spontaneous as I would like to think you know that, that you can be you just you know when you've got two children and a house uh, that, you, that you take care of and and plus two full-time careers 
um, you, you got a plan. And, you know, I guess I resent some of the spontaneity that it takes away. I mean, Al will frequently say, you know, we've got we've to decide which night this week we're going to go shopping for X, you know, a new bed for our two-year-old. He moved out of his crib and into a bed. And I said, well, no, let's just wait and, you know, let's just wait when we feel like it. But, it, you know, it doesn't work that way. Al, how tough is it? Oh, it is. I mean, it's real tough. A couple things make it easier. Number one, uh, we're more comfortable than we would have been 10 or 15 years ago financially. And that, it's, a, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a lot easier when you're comfortable financially. And secondly, it's a lot easier when you're older because you're more secure. Uh, when I, when our oldest boy, who's now seven, was 11 months old, uh, we, we had a, so the schedule switched uh, quickly, and I was going to cover a Senate race in New Mexico. I just packed him in the plane with me, and the two of us covered the Senate race together for, uh, for four days. I wouldn't have, I, I guess I was then, uh, I don't know, 39. I wouldn't have done that when I was 29. I wouldn't have been secure enough to mm -hmm. show up to cover a United States Senator with an 11-month old on my back. Are you trying to tell us you're mature now? <laughs> no, no, I'm slightly less insecure than I was when I was 29. But it was, and, 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 and I've, taken, I've taken Jeffrey and to some extent Benjamin uh, on, on other stories with me from time to time. It's actually, it's actually a lot of fun. Uh, and, 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 and you have to be able to, uh, to adjust like that. The other thing that we do, just in a very personal sense, because we do work such long hours during the week, is that we have a, we have a getaway place on weekends during the summer, and we're religious about going there all the time down the Chesapeake because that's really we get both quantity and quality time with the uh, with the children on summer weekends. We're at the end of the show, and I think I've asked everything that Barbara Walters would ask. Uh, Judy, can you give us a sign off? This is Judy Woodruff and Al Hunt signing off from Washington. To see more UWTV classics, visit uwtv.org/classics.